before to introduce uh, our main topic, I would like to do just to, to say a few words about our, our panelists. This is a really a valuable panel, uh, the unbelievable. They are really expert talking about uh, sanction, in particular talking about U.S. sanction against uh, Iran, against uh, Russia, and also they are uh, expert about uh, legal protection, uh, in particular talking about arbitration convention. I have uh, on my right side Miss Sarah Hunt. She is an uh, absolute expert uh, talking about uh, persecution uh, against uh, the U.S. court. Supreme Court in particular, and uh, uh, she's a partner of uh, the law firm Holman Fen Fenwick Willan in Geneva. And uh, the other two uh, gentlemen are uh, Mr. Luca Gersley and uh, Brian Falk, both of them associate in uh, uh, Schellenberg Whitmer. Uh, before to go much more into our subject, I would like to just to, to do a brief uh, introduction. Uh, going the, into 2009, uh, the world looks uh, worldly. You know, as uh, from uh, Brazil to Italy, more populists are in power, the global economy is more fragile than it was uh, a year ago, the market trajectory, a trade war between America and, and China is underway, and technology arose growing and based the international order in under trade. They, they make this is a tricky time for prediction, but also an, a, 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 a possibility to really uh, approach properly such kind of challenge. What is uh, the main purpose of our, of our panel? The main purpose is to understand our companies, in particular oil uh, and commodity space companies, could approach and could uh, make it profitable in this kind of uh, uncertainty uh, scenario. Main question I'd like to ask to you, Sarah. Uh, would you just give us a general overview about the actual status of the sanction against, uh, I don't know, if you want Iran and Russia. I don't know if you want to start from Iran or from Russia. It's up to you. Great. Thank well, you. It, it is a real delight to be here. Thank you so much, Marco, for that introduction. Thank you also to our hosts, Integral Petroleum, Morat and the lovely Shrin, and to all of you for, for being interested enough to come along and hear about sanctions, particularly sanctions imposed by our friends in the United States through the Office of Foreign Asset Control, and of course, those sanctions not always being identically replicated by the European Union. And again, we see some divergence when we turn to our friends in Switzerland, the Swiss regulator, of course, being SECO, and my friends and colleagues, uh, Luca and Brian, are going to talk about the Swiss side um, a bit more generally as we move through. The most interesting development, of course, in sanctions just in um, 2018, in this last year, has been the increasing divergence between the direction taken by OFAC, the US regulator, and the European Union uh, on the other side of the pond. We, of course, have most recently seen the dramatic revocation of sanctions against Rusal, the Russian aluminium company that has had an enormous effect on international trade and on the markets. And the very latest, you may have read in the press, is that the US Senate, which was asked to consider a motion to block the revocation of sanctions against Rusal, refused to block that motion, meaning, meaning that Roussel is going most likely to be cleared of sanctions and the continuing licenses which allow existing trades in a limited fashion up until the 28th of January will in all probability be lifted at some point shortly thereafter. Now on Iran, of course, we saw an extraordinary drama um, in the bringing back of sanctions against Iran by the United States. Um, 
and an equally dramatic counter-reaction from the European U Union, hence a, a divergence of direction. On the one hand, the US, through its regulator OFAC, sought to reimpose a complex raft of sanctions, um, whilst the EU insisted that compliance with those sanctions was prohibited, introducing a blocking regulation so that EU companies should not comply with US sanctions. I think that's the most interesting development of 2018, and looking ahead, it will be very interesting to see whether that divergence continues or whether um, the pre-2018 um, similarity of pattern of sanctions um, is more the trend. I think at the moment we're certainly seeing um, the market speaking and insisting that the April 2018 sanctions against Roussel be lifted. Yeah. I don't know uh, uh, if he, uh, uh, Sarah, you would like just to, to go just a bit more into your uh, uh, absolutely your slides, uh, just so uh, in order to give uh, to to our. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. To our guest, uh, a, a general overview. Yeah. Look, sanctions is a, a topic I'm quite passionate about, actually, and uh, whilst a lot of the work that um, that I do is in international trade. Um, specifically um, advisory and a lot of contentious work, a lot of litigation. We are seeing in Holman Fenwick Will, we have a sanctions team comprised of my colleagues um, Dan Martin, often fondly referred to as the sanctions man, Anthony Woolwich and Pauline Aurora in our Paris office, um, a team of lawyers that analyse sanctions on a daily basis. And we get a lot of queries from traders, we get a lot of questions from banks, how can we ensure that our trade finance is sanctions safe, is compliant? So, what do we need to think about then when we talk about being business compliant for sanctions? First of all, I think it's really important to understand how your business is organised because sanctions bite or start to affect you differently based on what product you're trading, where you're trading, and of course, most interestingly, based on the nationality of your UBO and directors. So for example, if you have a US green card holder or passport holder as a director, then unless that director is recused or excused from his or her obligations, US sanctions will effectively be attracted to the entire actions of the company, quite regardless of the fact that you are not trading in US dollars and that you think they do not otherwise bite. It is hence very important not only to know your client, and of course if you're a bank, your client's client, but to know in great detail your business and to understand the ways sanctions affect different commodities and different jurisdictions. Now, we are going to um, take a quick look at the events in the Ukraine. We're going to analyse the lifting of sanctions against Russell. We're going to talk about Iran, um, the re-imposition of sanctions against Iran and the European counter to the US regulator, OFAC, in the blocking regulation. I know there's some interest here in the room about the new special purpose vehicle the European Union-led plan to bring Iranian crude back into the market post the US sanctions reimposition and the revocation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, we're also going to have to, dis we're also going to look at what you have to do these days to um, bring softs into Iran. Obviously a very complex exercise indeed, given the banking difficulties faced with all of the Iranian banks essentially being listed now. Um, there are also some interesting time limits applicable to the sectorally sanctioned identification list entities I'm just going to remind you of, along with a short review of business tools. And particularly, we need to be aware of the importance of using KYC to be very clear on what sanctions attract each individual um, trade. 
Okay, so general issues. We've talked about um, the importance of know your own business. I thought I'd just point out the US regulator, the US sanctions regulator, OFAC, will block funds wherever in the chain they are found. So if, for example, you conduct some sort of illegal trade, but you don't know that your end um, receiver is going to send that petroleum product into a place where it shouldn't be going, whether that's, for example, Syria or, or Iran. Now, the problem for you as a mid-user, not knowing that that's the end destination of that cargo, is that you could be the victim of a sudden freezing of funds. It's dramatic. Those funds may not ever be able to be released. There's no ordinary course of appeal through to OFAC. You can file an administrative review request, but if, unbeknownst to you as the innocent trader, your end supplier has decided to break sanctions, you could be out of pocket in the tune of millions. And of course, we've seen that sort of thing. Again, know your customer, know your customer's customer, know really where that business is going. Be aware, as I mentioned, that US sanctions will bite wherever you are in the US jurisdiction. So where you have a US director, where you have a US ultimate beneficial owner, where you have a US parent company, where you are walking onto a US aeroplane. Before you even hit US airspace, US sanctions already bite. Similarly, EU sanctions, for example, the blocking regulation, which we're going to briefly discuss, will bite wherever there is an EU passport holder. That bites on you as a director, as an employee. The reach of sanctions is sometimes more far-fetching than we can be necessarily immediately aware of. So it's important to understand trade flows and, of course, how sanctions change as you move from one country to another. Most interestingly, of course, where sanctions are actually contradictory, where you have the US saying one thing and the EU saying exactly the opposite. So I thought I'd take a look at the Ukraine and remind us all that the pattern of EU and US sanctions against Russia regarding the Ukraine initially followed a roughly parallel direction. So we had the US blocking property of additional persons contributing to the situation in the Ukraine. The memorable Executive Order 13622 that was brought out in 20 March 2014 in response to events in the Ukraine. And there was a corresponding EU regulation 833 of 2014. However, there was this dramatic divergence we saw with the implementation of CATSA, which is countering America's adversaries through Sanctions Act, initially brought in in August 2017. And I think most dramatically, let's recall that all this discussion regarding Russell, the Russian aluminium company, started out in the April 6 sanctions. Those sanctions dramatically listed Russell as an SDN, a specially designated national an entity with which, under the US rules, it is prohibited to trade, save for existing wind-down licenses. Now, let's recall that these 6 April sanctions were particularly severe and penalised using secondary sanctions anyone who, as a non-US company or citizen, chose to breach those sanctions by entering into new business with Russell. And of course, the penalties for breaching US sanctions are not so minor. They include serious fines. We look at the billion dollar fines that have been handed down against banks. Um, you can, if you are a trader or an individual, perhaps a, a well-known Russian individual doing business with in the market, you can suddenly find yourself from one day to the next listed as an SDN. Of course, there are so many people like Oleg Deripaska, um, like Gennady Timchenko, who are our most famous SDNs in <clears throat> the special club of people who fall under this uh, prohibition, this insistence on freezing of funds and 
um, this very strict rule which was applied in the 6 April sanctions. So the US really wanted to stop business with Rusal on the 6th of April. Yes, However, uh, thank you. Skipping, uh, I mean, uh, to go much more in deep about the uh, Rusal case, uh, because I know that uh, it's a, a very a important point uh, also for the implication that uh, this kind of uh, uh, sanction uh, uh, provided uh, in the uh, aluminium market. I'd Absolutely. Like to, to, to ask you much more in deep uh, a focus about the sanction against Iran, uh, sure. different approach uh, provided by uh, EU and the US. Quite. And if it's possible, also, um, I mean, a sort of uh, parallel uh, among uh, sanction against uh, uh, Russia and sanction yeah. against Iran. Quite. So. Let's, let's just jump to the Iran slide. The Iran um, situation is indeed a, a conflict between, on the one hand, the reissuing of a complex raft of Iranian sanctions, um, and that was the US's dramatic decision to withdraw from this joint comprehensive plan of action on the 8th of May, to steer this divergent course from the European Union. Um, and the European Union, of course, very much wants to keep alive the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is why it issued its blocking regulation to counter the effect of US reimposition of Iranian sanctions. Now, what is important to realise about this blocking regulation is that it is actually a requirement in EU states to report to the regulator if you think you have breached the um, blocking regulation, which means you have taken steps to comply with US sanctions. Obviously, this puts companies in a very difficult situation. Absolutely. You are um, potentially um, sitting in the EU. You have a US parent company. Now, your US parent company obviously requires its subsidiaries to comply to the T with US sanctions, and it's the secondary sanctions that the blocking regulation is targeting. Okay? So as an EU subsidiary, on the one hand, you must comply with US sanctions because your UN parent company will be penalised if you don't, and those penalties, as we've discussed, are very serious. Yet as an EU subsidiary, you are required not to comply. In fact, even applying for a US licence with OFAC is a breach of the EU blocking regulation. Caught between a rock and a hard place, um, obviously, and uh, one, we've actually sent out a briefing bulletin to clients. You're welcome to email us if you'd like to get regular updates on sanctions, but the, um, the course uh, which would seem to be wisest is to very carefully document decisions that are taken in relation to um, business in Iran, and if business decisions are taken on the basis of um, financial necessity rather than um, compliance with US sanctions, then that decision needs to be documented very carefully and that reason kept in your records. Okay. Um, so penalties, of course, for non-compliance with this EU blocking regulation include fines. Um, there is even a it's a, it's a criminal action which, which would be run in the UK for a breach with a, a fine, the penalty. It's a more administrative penalty in many of the, on the continent, in many other systems here. Right. You know that, I mean, to, to have a sort of a parallel among uh, the I mean, the general approach provided by US, uh, provided by EU uh, in sanction against uh, uh, Russia and Iran, uh, and taking account also, we have uh, many uh, trading companies located in Switzerland. I would just to give you, uh, Luca, briefly, the possibility to explain uh, a sort of uh, uh, Swiss approach, if uh, we can uh, talk about the Swiss approach. Yes, good morning everyone. Thank you very much to the organizers the for one. having me here. Uh, can we please bring up my presentation? I think it's just the green one actually, Luca. Just keep... Press green. We know as Switzerland is fully integrated in EU, but uh, for many reasons uh, it's also uh, 
is also frequently politi for political reasons uh, and also for economic, economic reasons. Uh, frequently, uh, Swiss government uh, is used to have uh, a different approach to such kind of situation. We know, for example, talking about sanctions against Russia, talking about uh, foods uh, as uh, all of the EU um, sanctioned uh, Russia, but uh, uh, Switzerland uh, adopted a different approach uh, and making possible also for many of our companies uh, doing such business in commodity trading, soft commodity trading, uh, I mean, uh, reach such a huge market as uh, talking about, uh, about Russia. Please, Luca. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Marco. So I will now speak about trade sanctions from a Swiss perspective. And I think this is relevant to the audience for several reasons. The first reason is that you will discover during my presentation how Swiss listed individuals and entities can delist themselves from Swiss sanctions list. And secondly, it's also relevant to Swiss based companies to know exactly what the regulatory, the criminal, as well as the contractual consequences of a breach of sanctions are, and how to best mitigate these risks. Now very briefly on the, on the legal framework of Swiss sanctions. First of all, you have sanctions imposed on the basis of the Swiss constitution, as well as the Foreign Illicit Asset Act. These are sanctions that are imposed by Switzerland autonomously, and normally they target politically exposed persons from um, failed or failed states or states that are on the brink, brink of failure. So you have such uh, sanctions enforced at the moment against uh, certain individuals of the Ukraine, as well as Tunisia. In Ukraine, it concerns individuals from the entourage of the former president Yanukovych. Then the second le legal basis uh, for Switzerland to impose trade sanctions is the Embargo Act. Um, and according to this piece of law, Switzerland implements UN, EU, and other Switzerland's trading partners' sanctions. Uh, and the specific measures uh, towards certain states, regimes, or entities are contained in Swiss government ordinances. And listed to, uh, annexed to these ordinances, you have lists of entities and individuals targeted. So at the moment, there are 23 Swiss sanction programs, and notably, um, there is no sanction program in force in Switzerland against Iran or against Russia or Russian um, individuals and entities. The enforcement authority in Switzerland is the State Secretariat of uh, Economic Affairs, uh, abbreviated as SECO. Now here I have listed different type of um, measures that um, can be taken um, on the basis of the Embargo Act. Uh, just for your reference, I won't go through all of them, but the first one, of course, are financial uh, sanctions, Secondly, embargoes, and the other ones are a bit less uh, relevant for our purposes. Now, when it comes to implementation by Switzerland of EU, UN, and other trading partners' sanctions, how does that work? When it comes to UN Security, San uh, UN Security Council sanctions, those are implemented automatically without the need of an additional piece of law. However, EU sanctions um, are implemented by the Swiss government on a case-by-case -case basis, and usually they weigh up Swiss national interests before implementing those, and we'll see on the next slide what these interests are. Now when it comes to US or other trading partners' sanctions, there is, in general, no alignment by Swiss authorities. And as I mentioned before, this is very relevant in terms of Iran and Russian sanctions. However, there is one field where foreign sanctions are also applied in Switzerland, and this is in the banking industry. So the FINMA, the Financial Market Authority of Switzerland, 
uh, considers that Swiss banks must comply with any sanctions worldwide, otherwise they would be in breach of the Swiss supervisory law, and this could have consequences actually on their banking license. So in practice, Swiss banks comply with any foreign imposed sanctions, including you, US sanctions. Take a look at, I mean, you are talking about a, a reputational risk yes. related to the Swiss bank in case they should be in breach of, uh, I mean, the, the, the sanction uh, legislation. Yes, that's correct. And I have two examples. For example, you have Credit Suisse in 2009. They have breached US sanctions. And um, the same also goes for BNP Paribas. They have also breached US sanctions. And there were enforcement proceedings opened by the Swiss Financial Market Authority against them. And this is a very important precedent, which now prevents any Swiss bank from breaching um, US sanctions. Sada, do you have a similar situation also talking about uh, US? I mean, uh, mm. do you have uh, any case about uh, the um, US banks uh, breached the, the sanction mechanism? Yes, I mean, uh, quite right, Marco. There are actually countless examples of banks um, breaching US sanctions. Yeah. Um, I mean, the fines uh, tend to be measured at about, I think it's a notional 60,000 US dollars per breach. And we see regularly fines um, of up to, uh, I think the latest is one point five billion is being mooted um, in relation to a, a breach from a, a London bank just at the moment in the press. But um, Swiss banks regularly do um, get fined and, and usually it is for what is described as a systemic and deliberate breach of, of US sanctions in relation to a typically um, US dollar transactions through a, um, a place which is prohibited. Um, so at the moment, obviously, Iran petroleum product transactions. Um, I just wanted to mention mm -hmm. the question I had um, for Luca is, it's very interesting, I see, that Switzerland has not embraced the European Union's blocking regulation. Right. And I wondered, Luca, if you could comment on that very sage Swiss mm -hmm. perspective on a regulation that has obviously caused some complications for EU companies right. in the situation we described where you have a US parent company and you are in a direct conflict. Mm -hmm. M maybe I will answer to this question by asking you one question. Yes. <laughs> Did this, US, uh, this EU blocking regulation yeah. uh, bear its fruits, actually? Ha -ha. Well, what, <laughs> uh, what we, I got to say, I got to say, <laughs> wow. <laughs> What, what we see, of course, with the, the EU blocking regulation is um, it is a, a statement, really, uh, more than <laughs> necessarily something that's going to have any real, real impact or bite. Mm -hmm. In theory, the EU is attempting to offer legal protection to companies that, um, that want to um, breach US sanctions, mm -hmm. that want to respect the blocking regulation that says don't comply with the US sanctions. And the ways that the EU tries to offer enforcement include um, annulment of any enforcement decisions within the EU jurisdiction, uh, and, and the ways that they try to encourage compliance with the EU blocking regulation are by offering fines and penalties for non-compliance with it. However, when we think about the very long reach, the long arm of the US and its jurisdiction through the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the regulator. The problem is that the penalty for breach of US sanctions as a trader is so enormous because being listed as a specially designated national, as we all know, is an incredible penalty and it changes your life from one day to the next and companies have to be shut down and ultimate beneficial ownership, as we've seen with Oleg Deripaska, has to be transferred, as has been negotiated in Washington in the past few weeks, in order to enable that company to continue functioning. So, in a way, it's, um, it's a little bit of an empty threat because you can't stop the US from listing mm -hmm. SDNs, and you can't stop banks from wanting to comply with US sanctions when the penalty of fines is such an incredible disincentive. So, a, a tricky one. But, but, but Sarah, I think this EU blocking regulation was, yes. was not that effective because, factually speaking, yes. EU firms are pulling out 
from Iran, right? Yes. In spite of this blocking regulation. Uh, and there, I think, um, look at the timing is interesting to mm -hmm. note because we saw the revocation of the U.S. the U.S.'s participation in the joint comprehensive plan of action occurred um, quite some months before the EU had time mm -hmm. to put together its blocking regulation, so that in fact US sanctions had already been implemented by the time the EU blocking regulation came in. And indeed, um, it is quite correct to say that we have largely pulled out of Iran. Mm -hmm. Now, one issue that perhaps we could look at, a um, related issue, are softs. And I know that there are some softs traders here, and the issue of trading softs in Iran is an interesting one. What we see with um, the idea, of course, is that the, the US has sought to allow and enable trading of softs with Iran. However, in practice, almost all Iranian banks are now listed as SDNs. They're just about all listed. And some of them are not only listed, but they are also subject to secondary sanctions, which means that if even if there's no US connection to that trade, if, a tr if monies are received from those banks, the consequences are a potential listing. So there are two different levels of listing of Iranian banks. But the real problem with the, um, the permission, because there is a general license which is granted by OFAC to continue trading softs and medicines with Iran, is that practically speaking, no banks want to receive the payment for providing those medicines and foods. Now, some of you may be aware that there was a case before the International Court of Justice, which Iran won, insofar as the International Court of Justice held that to the extent that the US sanctions against Iran were not allowing the continuing sale of these foods and medicines into Iran, that aspect of the sanctions is illegal. However, the judgment from the International Court of Justice is unenforceable. And the US has declared that it plans to withdraw, given notice of one year, from the applicable treaty under which these obligations were, were called upon. So in fact, this, this International Court of Justice ruling saying that um, the US must put measures into place to enable continuing trade with Iran, which basically means allowing banking with Iran for sale of softs and medicines, has not worked. Now, I, I think there is one quite easy solution for this, and that is that the, the learned legislators and, and our worthy colleagues in the Office of Foreign Asset Control might write a very clear and affirmative answer to a frequently asked question, which might read along the lines of, Apart from the STN listings of Iranian banks, it is permissible for Iranian banks to make payments for permitted foodstuffs and medicines that are legitimately being sold into Iran because there is the general license which allows that. And that would be a very easy thing to do to enable compliance with the International Court of Justice ruling, and of course, compliance with the rule of law on a worldwide basis is something that um, needs to be encouraged. This is a very, very uh, I mean, a practical uh, case, uh, talking about uh, soft commodities uh, um, against uh, Iran. Uh, before to give to, to Brian uh, the words and to, to give, I mean, to go much more in deep about uh, legal protection uh, in a case of war and conflict, uh, which kind of, what, what could offer the, the arbitration convention, also the international law, or also, I mean, just uh, contact. Uh, I'd like to ask, ask to you, uh, Luca, if you could, uh, I mean, just uh, give you a few words uh, about uh, the effect of such, such sanction uh, following, uh, I mean, the, the Swiss approach, if I can say in this way. Okay. Because, I mean, uh, we understood uh, really in deep, uh, thinking to, to Sada, as the uh, US, uh, are really, really brave, really strong, such a kind of approach. And we know all, to, all, all together, we, really, we, we will know as the US are used to be so, 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 so aggressive. But uh, I mean, I've got to understand if uh, 
uh, the Swiss approach could be different uh, and uh, if uh, I mean, uh, doing a sort of parallel uh, with the, 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 the US approach, uh, so this approach could, is, is different, uh, is similar, is uh, much more soft, what? Yeah, thank you, Marco. So maybe some practical tips uh, from, uh, from the Swiss perspective in terms of consequences of a breach of sanctions. So consequences can be threefold. First, if a Swiss company, a Swiss bank breaches sanctions, the regulators might, might jump in and revoke a banking license in extreme cases or revoke um, exports licenses. Then from a criminal point of view, um, you are also um, liable for a breach of a sanction ordinance, uh, for example the sanction ordinance on Ukraine. Um, and the defaults the default punishment for that is half a million Swiss francs of fine and one year in prison. Then in serious cases, it can go up to one million Swiss francs in fines and five years imprisonment. If a Swiss-based company refuses access to the SECO, um, to the SECO employees, uh, or refuses to hand over documents upon request of SECO, in that case, uh, the fine can go up to 100,000 Swiss francs. And another very um, important um, aspect is that if managers, um, and I would say in general the management of a company, allows a breach of Swiss sanctions, it can be held liable, um, although this breach was committed actually by an employee da down on the chain of command. And the prosecution time bar in Switzerland uh, for breach of uh, the embargo law and the federal uh, ordinances is five years. Then the third consequence is a consequence on contracts. But I yeah. think we, we will discuss that later as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. This is one of the main points. I really would like to, to, to have your point, uh, in particular also, uh, I mean, Sarah's experience. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Thank you so much, Luca. I'd like to, to involve Brian um, to a different topic. I mean, in, in, uh, I mean uh, it's important uh, investment protection because, uh, in particular, we're talking about uh, the Caspian area. This is uh, our, our topic, of course. And uh, we know as uh, um, foreign investment in order to, to go, uh, to, to, to be effective, uh, should yeah. be uh, protected. Uh, I want to uh, ask. Um, to Brian, a general question. Um, we just briefly we just uh, mentioned about uh, Ukraine, sanction against Ukraine, the, the conflict at the moment we have in Ukraine, but uh, we could mention also other part, different parts of the world that now are not uh, stable. For example, we could talk about uh, Venezuela. We know, uh, recent uh, fact and situation. And I'd like to ask uh, Brian, uh, according to your experience uh, and according to to, to, to what uh, could you really explain to, our, to us and to our guests, to commodities trade companies, uh, which kind of, uh, which kind of uh, protection could uh, be offered in case of a conflict or in case of war to, uh, to investment? Yep. Thank, you, thank you, Marco, for that question. So we've heard a lot about sanction, and I'm going to talk about something totally different. Uh, I'm talk, going to talk about uh, investment protection under international law. As Marco has noted, um, nowadays we're investing or doing business in a very complex world. There are many geopolitical conflicts or sanctions, so it's a very difficult and complicated world, but there are ways uh, under international law where you could mitigate those risks and try to sort to and maximize uh, protection for your investment. So for the first slide, I'm just going to give an overview of the general uh, investment risk for any type of business or any type of project. So I've divided them into two categories of risk. You have political and non-commercial risk. These are risks that affects everybody and you're not really in control. They can be as extreme as war and conflict, changes in government, there might be elections, the government that is favorable to your yep. sector or your business might lose in an election and you have a new government that pursue a totally different policy. 
or the government might introduce a different law or regulations. So these are political and non-commercial risk. And in terms of legal protection, what, what is available to you? You have protection under international law, which I'll go further detail uh, in my presentation, or you have protection under the national law. So usually in the national constitution or, or in the public law of that country, it will offer investors a certain minimum standard of protection. For example, legitimate expectation or governments have to introduce new policies uh, in accordance with due process. So these are types of protections available to you under uh, national law. And the second type of risk are business and commercial risk. And these risks um, you can control much better. For example, changes in demand and supply. These economic changes affect your sector, but you can negotiate terms that are favorable to, to you. For example, you can increase the cost or reduce the cost or renegoti re renegotiate the pricing terms. Or you have financial risk, for example, cash flow problems, maybe you, you need to get a loan or uh, your counterparty default on a transaction. <laughs> Operational risk, daily business risk, uh, human resources risk or uh, supply, you don't get enough supply. And these type of business and commercial risks, you should protect by contract, by having, for example, more flexible contractual arrangement so that you won't be in breach of a contract if these risks occur. Then what, what could, could you suggest uh, uh, in such a situation in Venezuela in order to protect the investment? Yeah, but Venezuela is a good example because in the South America, um, there's, there's been a lot of investment treaty uh, arbitrations and Venezuela has been hit very heavily because they've lost a lot of awards. But uh, before I talk about investment arbitration, I want to introduce the concept of investment treaties, which is offered the best protection for you under international law. So what are investment treaties? They're multilateral or bilateral in international agreements made between states and the purpose is to promote foreign and cross-border investment. And what do they do? They guarantee a minimum standard of protection for foreign investors. And I've given four, kinds, uh, four different examples of the actual protections you have under in international treaties. For example, fair and equitable treatment. The government has to treat you fairly and equitably. National treatment or most favored nation treatment. So this basically protects you against discrimination. The government cannot discriminate you as a foreign investor vis-a-vis -vis their own nationals or other foreign investors. And protection against unlawful expropriation, those are actions taken by the government to expropriate your investment. So maybe they can nationalize your investment or they can just take over your project. So those are what I mean by unlawful expropriation and right to repatriate uh, your investment returns. So if you invested money in a, in, a, in a foreign country, these treaties would give you the right to take back the investment returns to your home country. And these are very important protections. And traditionally, how do you enforce the protection is by in international arbitration. And this next slide, I think, would be of interest to the audience because we are here in the Caspian Week and I've outlined the treaty framework in the Caspian region. So in, in this week, we have covered uh, seven countries. Uh, the seven Caspian countries are Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia and Turkmenistan. And if you look at the numbers, only Iran has treaties with all other six Caspian countries. So let's say if you're a Russian investor and you want to invest in Georgia, you're not, you have no treaty to protect you. And that is where the last point on the slide comes into play. There are foreign countries like China, Egypt, France, Germany, Italy, Romania, Spain, Switzerland, Ukraine or Uzbekistan. They have treaties with all seven countries. So let's say if you're a Russian investor looking to do business in Georgia, for example, you might want to do that investment by way of a German vehicle, Italian vehicle, Spanish or Swiss uh, company, then you can rely on the treaty between those independent states with Georgia that would offer you um, uh, investment treaty uh, protection under international law. And very briefly onto the next slide, there are multilateral treaties, but there's no multilateral treaties covering all seven states. You have the Energy Charter Treaty, which is the 
the very important treaty in the energy uh, space, but that only has five parties in the Caspian region, and they are Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. And I've listed also three other examples of multilateral treaties. But you see the coverage is not comprehensive. So you, I, I would suggest you should rely on uh, bilateral uh, treaties more, uh, which, is, which I've shown in the previous slide. I have one question to you and probably to everybody. Um, I mean, uh, which kind of practical, uh, uh, practical uh, experience could you explain to our guests about such treaties? I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, in this uh, general scenario in cui institutions are in trouble, in cui international law seems to be not stable as uh, in the past, according to you, such kind of bilateral or multilateral approach in order to protect investment could really be uh, the solution or the final solution remain, uh, remains uh, always uh, a sort of contractual protection? Yeah, and Marco, you've mentioned a great point. So on this slide, I've outlined the recent challenges of uh, protection under international law. And I've cited the UCOS case, which Russia has lost uh, an award, arbitral award, uh, and it has to pay 50 billion in damages. And that is an award under the Energy Charter Treaty. So that is obviously a very bad outcome for Russia. And, uh, and as a result, Russia has withdrew from the Energy Charter Treaty and has introduced these new policies for future BITs, which will make it much more difficult for investors to bring claims under international treaties. And you've seen Kazakhstan has also lost quite a lot of money, and Ecuador and India, they've also announced termination of BITs, and the EU is also taking a stance uh, against BIT um, arbitration. And to end my presentation, I want to introduce some new concepts or new options that uh, investors should consider other than traditional protection under investment treaties. And as Mark have mentioned and also touched upon by Luca uh, briefly, contractual protection is much more important now because in this day and age, you no longer can you rely on your country to protect you. So you have to defend yourself and how can you do that? negotiate a robust and strong co uh, contractual protection for your investment. Mm -hmm. And as the second bullet point, offshore dispute resolution is also very important. And some of you might have attended the launch of the Caspian Arbitration Association last night. Yes. And that is a very timely yeah. development because, for example, in the future for investment in the Caspian region, you might want to consider having an arbitration clause referring disputes to this new uh, Caspian Arbitration Association. And these are the um, options available to you. And I've also uh, listed p uh, political risk insurance. That is also uh, a conventional uh, option that you have to remember is very expensive because un unlike commercial insurance where the force majeure clauses was exclude like war and conflict or change in government policy, these insurance cover them, and as a result, they're much more expensive. The premium you need to pay is much more expensive. You see, I mean, we have uh, many, many, many topics uh, in order to go much more in deep, uh, because it's uh, it's uh, really we should stay here. I mean, till uh, this uh, till dinner, in order to go really in deep and to 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 give it a chance to our uh, our distinguished panelists really to provide all of their data value. Uh, before to go, uh, but unfortunately, I mean, time is money, also time of our guest, then we have to, to go much more fast. I will just uh, to, um, before to go much more in detail about the sanction, uh, in particular, Sarah, uh, about uh, uh, what's happened, uh, Russell case, uh, I would like just, uh, um, and also, uh, in order and, and to go uh, much more aware about uh, um, which kind of uh, uh, best compliance uh, practice uh, could you suggest to have a guest in order really to, uh, protect, to protect their investment in uh, Iran or Iran, uh, in Russia in such a kind of, of stable scenario. I will just uh, um, to, um, to, 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 to have uh, your point about, uh, um, I mean, the situation in Venezuela, mm. what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, we know that in 2008, uh, Sara, one of uh, major in um, oil company, I mean, uh, 
provided, provided uh, was involved in very, in very huge dispute about investment in Venezuela. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm very curious to, to understand uh, this is also in order to, under, to, to have uh, a perspective for other different situations. How did they solve such a, um, such a um, unpredictable situation? Mm. Yeah, very interesting question, uh, Marco. And, and I think Luca and I are going to speak briefly about um, business tools and compliance generally. A culture of compliance is, of course, critical for being aware of which jurisdictions, such as Venezuela, where we had the US prohibition on using a particular type of um, locally induced, uh, locally created Bitcoin. And it was making payments to local port operators extremely difficult. Now, of course, you're always going to find um, traders that go there and, and get around those regulations. But I think for banks and for traders, there are a couple of key takeaways. And I would say um, business tools for banks and traders certainly would have to include receiving appropriate um, notifications through a relatively sophisticated system. Now, we use World Compliance. We find that an, an excellent program. There are many um, similar systems. There's World Check. And what these checks, of course, do is they flag up, in the first instance, whether or not your counterparty is listed as an SDN or whether there are certain applicable time limits if there is an SSI, or sectorally sanctioned identification list entity, in the chain. Now, if you have an SSI, as many of you will be aware, either US or EU sanctions are going to bite. So the time limit will be either 14 days or 28 days or 60 days. And you need to know which one it is. And that's going to depend on which sanctions bite. That's for those time limit, um, especially listed entities where it's not prohibited to trade, but there are time limits applicable to new debt. Now, those time limits actually will bite in two different ways. You have to think about um, when you are advancing new debt, you have to think about both not lending for longer than the appropriate time, and you need to think about not prepaying. So there's prepayments that can also breach the time limit prohibitions. Um, Luca, did you want to say something about the way those processes and checklists should be implemented? Absolutely. So on, on this slide, you have an overview of what the right corporate culture should be. So basically, uh, the right corporate culture in terms of compliance and risk mitigation should rest on three pillars. The first one is prevention, the second is detection, and then response. Uh, so it's very important that compliance programs are implemented by senior management, right? And that the tone must be set from the top. And then to introduce specific policies and procedures which would define one person of a team of person that are in charge with compliance issues and train employees of the firm and introduce also best practices. Then risk assessment must be done also on a continuous basis by legal and regulatory monitoring, um, as well as media monitoring. And as Sarah pointed out, it's very important that channels are in place uh, whereby employees can escalate their doubts um, to, to some uh, compliance managers. Please go much more in deep, talk about such a slide, because according to me, this is really the core in order to, to fully understand how could, uh, in particular, I'd like to, to recommend, uh, please, uh, um, our commodity trading companies and banks, uh, in order to support uh, our commodity trading company, could really hmm. be uh, in the position uh, to... Um, to know. Know your yeah. customer, know your yeah. customer's customer. Look, I think you're quite right. Uh, Marco, in saying this is a key issue for traders. They want to know how to avoid being um, in the hot seat when that 20 million cargo gets frozen and it's, it's done on when, when payment is, is about to hit their account. And, and of course, I can think of an example which, um, which we have worked on where overnight, so that the trade on Monday is perfectly legal, the contracts are in place, um, the funds are about to hit the 
um, the recipient's bank, and overnight, Monday night, the payer is listed as a specially designated national, so that instead of a legal trade, you're suddenly in the middle of a trade with an SDN, and the 20 million that was about to be credited to your account has been blocked as it passes through the US SWIFT system, and your bank is telling you that it is impossible to release those funds. Um, and, and, and look, I think there really is no easy answer to how to avoid that situation. The earlier example I spoke of, know your clients, clients know where the end destination of that cargo is, is an important one to bear in mind. Um, there is a solution, incidentally, to that dramatic $20 million fund blocking example. You can, um, let's just say the payment is made in euros, you can draft a tripartite agreement whereby your middle trader, the, the trader, it's, if it's A, B to C, and B is listed as an SDN, you can novate your contract so that A trades directly with C, so that B withdraws from the trade, and if the trades in euros certainly back in 2014-15, that sort of thing was actually approved by OFAC. Query whether it would be now, I only say that because the uh, sanctions in response to events in the Ukraine certainly were very much tightened, the screws were tightened as of the 6 April 2018 sanctions that I described earlier. However, that was a, a legitimately approved um, uh, solution for such a dramatic um, disaster which we've been involved in. Um, and I, I also just wanted to mention in, in relation to solutions broadly, I was going to speak very briefly about the SPV, and I know there was some yeah. interest on the SPV, so could I be, thought to indulge myself and, and, well, look, this special purpose vehicle yeah. is, of course, an EU-led solution. And the idea is that the EU will provide this special purpose vehicle. The very latest on that is it's perhaps going to be registered in France and perhaps going to be run operationally by a German representa representative who's going to um, ensure that the EU states promise to facilitate legitimate financial transactions with Iran in accordance with European Union law, as stated by Federica Mogherini, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs for the EU in September 2018, can actually come about. But even with this potential solution to enable um, companies and countries to continue to purchase Iranian crude, we can see some very obvious problems. First, you have to ask yourself, even though we've, we've had this um, potential solution from the, from the French and the Germans, there is still a real question over who is prepared to host the special purpose vehicle. There is also a very legitimate question about who is going to be prepared to use it. What traders really want to risk direct breach of US sanctions against Iran? And perhaps even more pertinently, what banks of those traders are going to be prepared to facilitate receipt of payments that are unquestionably going to have to be received from an SDN listed Iranian bank in direct breach of US sanctions, attracting secondary sanctions with the consequence of potential billion dollar fines. And I think that's a real question around the solution. Um, given um, there is a system of listing of Iranian banks and even the banks that are merely on the executive order 13599 list, this, the slightly softer listing where we are hoping that payments can be received eventually in respect of medicine and food. Um, this is already a problem. It's already the case that people are unable to supply food and medicine. And one um, European view um, is that the new special purpose vehicle may in fact likely be used more for these humanitarian and agricultural products. That might be a potential solution to what we're seeing with this big problem where all Iranian banks are essentially listed in different grades of SDN listing, which I think would be very positive. Um, and we also have to bear in mind, of course, that even though this is a potential solution we have in the background, um, 
the reality that the EU continues to issue sanctions against Iranian government institutions it suspects of plotting acts of terror. So it's a very complicated situation and we, um, we can only continue to monitor. Best practice involves, as I say, a, a, a very um, carefully implemented program, yep. including checklists, and, and, and ultimately, I think this is not necessarily the sort of thing that we yep. can outsource to um, a, uh, a computer system or, or some sort of a blockchain yep. solution. I think you, you need to know, you need to be able to put a call in to, um, to the regulator. You need to ask the regulator, can you explain what this yep. means? Can, can you confirm <laughs> that this, you need to get at least informal approval of something if you want to do it? Um, and I guess the, the other interesting point is, is that... Um, so Sarah, on yeah. this point, precisely on this point, I think maybe we can say something about how to approach regulators. Yeah. Um, I mean, in Switzerland, you can approach regulators very quickly, <laughs> efficiently. You write an email for well, an informal ruling. Well, you call them up. You, you, write, you write an email mm -hmm. to, um, to SECO, and of course, they're so wonderfully efficient that they will get back to you very often uh, within 24 hours. So you can have a very clear idea from the Swiss on exactly where the Swiss stand. How does this contrast with the US? Well, that's an interesting question, Luca. Um, <laughs> of course, at the moment, we have the US shutdown of its um, government. And at the moment, there are problems with contacting OFAC. Um, but I should stress that the, um, the officers, the good officers of OFAC are, of course, very, very hardworking. They're, I would say, surchargé. There's a huge pile of, of papers. It takes a long time to process a, an appeal um, to OFAC, and the best way to contact them is to have that personal contact with an officer who's, who, who can speak to you through the OFAC hotline and clarify questions, because um, written answers are less, less easily obtainable due to, I think, the volume. If you think about the volume of world trade, obviously Switzerland's a small country, the US is a very large country, and it implements sanctions worldwide, and there are multiple queries that come to them, and you have to wait in line um, for your answer there. I have a question. Um, thank you very much for your, uh, I mean, for brilliant uh, um, explanation. I want to, to best understand. Uh, I mean, uh, we we know that uh, in November 2008, uh, several states uh, they uh, received a sort of exemption, talking about yes. uh, sanction yes. against Iran. Absolutely. Then I want to better understand. Also, please give me also your point, uh, Luca. Uh, if, uh, uh, I mean, who, what, first point, the reason of such, such, such exemption. Second point, if you expect, uh, I mean, uh, to have uh, a sort of uh, uh, renovation. I mean, six, this kind of six month extension period could be, could be longer. Mm. Third point, if uh, you see a room for, uh, uh, for um, I mean, for Swiss company to uh, really, uh, to, uh, to benefit uh, Talk about such a, such situation. How uh, just uh, just uh, just uh, uh, go ahead uh, in the execution uh, with the, their uh, agreement uh, with the, the Iranian uh, oil company, just uh, involving a third party, for example the the Italian uh, national oil company, any, any or the one not under the sanction list. Good. Please. So um, we should note that the U.S. has indeed granted eight countries specific exemptions. These eight countries are China, 360 barrels uh, per day. Uh, we've got Greece and India on 300 um, K barrels per day. South Korea, 200 K. We've got Italy, Japan, Taiwan and Turkey on about 60 K barrels per day. So those special exemptions are of course part of the, the solution, the negotiated solution. And I think one thing we can draw from this discussion is that a negotiated solution with OFAC, as we've seen with, with Rusal, Russian Aluminium Company, this, this huge lobby that went on in Washington in the past few weeks, resulting in um, a, an agreement that Rusal is going to be delisted, is more likely to work than um, a solution where perhaps the, um, the EU tries to find a solution that's in breach of US sanctions, which I think is tricky for banks and tricky for traders. Um, the idea um, 
as I, as I understand it, Marco, with the special exemptions, is that those countries which successfully negotiated these deals with the US were those countries which showed a willingness to comply with US sanctions, showed a need for continuing purchase of Iranian crude, and were able to um, demonstrate a plan of winding down. Now, the interesting thing will be whether or not this six-month period of grace is indeed extended as we've seen with Roussel, where in fact, although Roussel was listed dramatically in April 2018, with wind down licenses operative for six months, in fact, those licenses have been extended right up until the 28th of this month, and after that, the listing will be lifted with massive implications worldwide for the aluminium market. We'll be expecting a cotango in the market. It's, I think it's very important for traders to be able to continue to trade aluminium. And I think the US itself has perhaps learnt from that experience that there is a cost of imposing economic sanctions. Economic sanctions, of course, are used as a, a tool essentially of, of, um, of economic warfare. And, and when that comes um, back to bite you, well, in this case, the US have indeed done an about face and we've had um, Munchen persuading the Senate to vote in favour of the, um, the relaxing of those sanctions against Russia. So we shall have to see. Um, I don't think there's going to be the same pressure, of course, in relation to Iranian crude. And obviously, that exempt crude is something that a Swiss um, buyer could buy. That's, that's clean. But um, we shall have to see what happens. Certainly, it will be very interesting to see how the special purpose vehicle uh, mooted by the EU evolves in the coming months. And a very topical issue as well. Thank you, Sarah. Look, you'd like to add something here or to Sarah, or I can I mean, uh, ask you a, a different question. I mean, in a, a, a such a kind of a sanction framework, it's very important to understand uh, if your agreement. Uh, was signed before or after this kind of uh, uh, sanction uh, uh, act. Could you just uh, very, very, uh, I mean, um, you could really, uh, could you, uh, at, could you uh, really outline in a very easy way how could the company should manage this kind of tricky situation? Okay, so, so, so I guess your question relates to um, the consequences on private contracts uh, of sanctions. Yeah. So if a sanction is imposed, let's say, on day one, and the contract is entered into on day three, if this sanction uh, prohibits these parties from contracting together, there are questions of private law that would say that the contract might be illegal, so it's null and void under Swiss law. But if it's the other way around, so the contract was entered into in day one, and the sanction was imposed on day three, then there might be questions of uh, subsequ uh, subsequent impossibility, or uh, one could uh, think as well of force majeure, um, as well as frustration, but I think this is also common in, in common law jurisdictions. And Quite right. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the usual solution for anticipating the imposition of sanctions on a counterparty is to implement one of what have now been, uh, become standard, sanctions clauses. So you've got the BP sanctions clause, you've got various um, voyage charter party sanctions yeah. clauses, which if anyone needs one, please feel free to email me, but they're circulating in the market and I'm sure you, you are all aware of that. Is, has anyone had any interesting sanctions question or query? Or you can come and see me afterwards, I know these are often best asked privately, but um, do, does anyone have a, a question on, or, or, or just on anything that we've discussed um, that they'd like to ask? Perhaps they'd like to know um, where we're going in the market with a particular commodity and sanctions. We've talked about oil, we've talked about metals, and we've mentioned softs and the struggle that softs traders... Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, Ambassador of US eh? yes. uh, sent some notes to German companies which are involved in the construction Nord Stream. Nord Stream, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you <laughs> comment with the situation? What will be, uh, will be with companies under some consequences of sanctions? Will be it a conflict between uh, 
American sanction and your EU, EU, EU. Uh, countries, or what will be? Yes. <laughs> we know it's what a will... very good point for your advisory. Yeah, yeah. We know what was with uh, Swiss banks when they uh, go uh, uh, against sanctions. Yes. Yeah? What will be with uh, German companies? <laughs> Yes, quite. Are, Thank you. Are you, are you asking Thank this you. Um, particularly in relation to the EU blocking regulation? You know that, that attempt by, really led by Angela Merkel, the, the, the EU proposal to, to stop um, EU companies complying with US sanctions. And for German companies in particular, interesting question, yes. So I think that it is, practically speaking, extremely difficult for German companies to comply with the EU blocking regulation. And the reason for that is because if, if they do comply and decide to breach US sanctions, then they have a twofold problem. Number one, they are at risk of being listed as a specially designated national, which obviously is a penalty that is frankly unpalatable for most companies. It is commercially um, it would be commercially irresponsible for a company to take a decision which would, which would present it with a very high risk of listing. And, of course, there is also the more practical problem of finding a bank that is ready to comply with a direct and deliberate breach of US sanctions. And we're talking about Swiss banks, and, of course, we're very familiar with Swiss banks and the way that they operate, and the incredible due diligence, the teams of hard-working Swiss bankers that work through late nights and weekends, ensuring that they are compliant. And why do they do this? Because the sanctions are, are absolutely um, horrendously, um, the, the fines that we have seen imposed on Swiss banks in the past decade have included um, regular billion, billion dollar fines. You know, the fines are not small, Fry. One of the fines has, has caused the close down of the Trade Finance Department, effectively, of one of Switzerland's most well known banks, rather tragically, because of, of course Switzerland has such a, a superb strength in, in this area. Yeah, before we go uh, yes. ahead uh, to the conclusion, uh, I'd like to uh, um, involve Brian uh, just to, to give us uh, um, uh, a couple of points. Uh, um, belong to your uh, experience uh, about uh, um, contractual protection. I mean, uh, how could uh, a contractual protection, of course, uh, in a framework uh, outside of uh, sanction, okay? In a normal sanction, uh, how could you suggest uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, to, to arrange uh, a con contractual protection, uh, talking ab about, uh, for example, an arbitration uh, clause, uh, in order to, and, and then also, I mean, if you, would like to suggest Geneva or, uh, or London or different kind of jurisdiction or, or jurisdiction or di different kind of court or not a court but uh, a, I mean a, a private arbitration in order to have a, a concrete uh, protection to the, the interest investment of the contractual parties and uh, also um, in order to prevent any dispute. Yeah, I think uh, the key principles for any contractual negotiation is first you look at the terms. You have to strike a balance between certainty and flexibility, because if it's too rigid and too certain, then it gives you very little room later on, whether it's, there's a new sanction or new commercial risk, you have a, a high risk of breach. So you have to strike a balance between um, certainty and flexibility. And also in terms of the rights you have on paper, you can write whatever you, you want on a piece of paper, but whether it is enforceable or not, that is another question. And when it comes to enforceability, as Marquez mentioned, um, you have to t think about whether you enforce it by way of uh, court litigation or arbitration. And in international transactions, it's much more common to agree on offshore arbitration because it gives you uh, access to an uh, impartial and independent tribunal who would adjudicate your disputes fairly and impartially. And um, popular choices would be Geneva, London, Paris, or in Asia you have Hong Kong or Singapore. And so my suggestion would be you'd think about carefully the terms you've put in your contract and to put in a very uh, uh, secure um, dispute resolution clause. So when something goes wrong, then at least 
you, you, you have a fair uh, panel or a fair or, or a well-trusted court which would adjudicate your dispute. Yeah. Yes. One well, well, moment, she's calm. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm from India. Uh, with respect to this specific question, doesn't it come down to um, enforceability at this country level? Like we could choose a safe jurisdiction like Singapore, London, Geneva, like you mentioned, but doesn't it come down to national level enforceability? Yes, you have to think about that. And for example, in arbitration, it's well known there's the New York Convention, and I think you have 150 something states were parties to New York Convention, so they've signed up to the convention saying that they will enforce a uh, award that is rendered in a convention jurisdiction. But in, in terms of the Caspian region, I, I, I can say Turkmenistan is the only country which, which is not party to the New York Convention, and I'm no expert on Turkmenistan law. I don't know how the national court would enforce an arbitration award or not, but sometimes when investors, when they do a deal, they might choose litigation. For example, it, because litigation, the judgments are usually more uh, easily uh, enforceable as compared to a arbitral award because a court would already have uh, mandatory or uh, powers to um, issue uh, uh, orders to, for, for example, uh, confiscate uh, property or so it has more uh, mandatory powers as compared to a tribunal. Some, so this is something you need to weigh, weigh your options, whether you want to have uh, arbitration but it's harder to enforce or you have litigation where a judgment is automatically enforceable without the need uh, for recognition. Uh, Sarah or Luca, you want to add something? Because it's, a, it's also it's a crucial point. That that's what was a very thorough uh, oh, it, answer of yes. my colleague. Yeah, okay. Yes, the power of local enforcement. Very, very true. Uh, in this framework uh, and uh, um, According to you, the, uh, the uh, Caspian uh, Arbitration Society announced yesterday, of course, uh, uh, talking about uh, such a part of the world that uh, is uh, the much more interesting for, uh, for everybody, at least uh, in such a room. Uh, according to your feeling, uh, such an uh, arbitration uh, society could uh, really support uh, a sort of uh, uh, I mean, uh, develop on, or, or, or such countries and uh, really attract uh, investment. Hmm. Or because we know that uh, I mean, sometimes uh, many many uh, uh, solution uh, yeah. are just for uh, involving just speculation for for lawyers or for uh, for just uh, it's a te technicality. I would like to understand how could we really uh, give. Uh, our point. Yeah. Well, look, as Vitaly, voilà. as, as Vitaly mentioned, this Vitaly Kozachenko, of course, spoke on the, um, the Caspian arbitration, um, the new framework last night, which I understand Guy Blackwood QC has also been very actively involved in drafting. And one of the features that I found very helpful in listening to that presentation on the rules is that part of the enforcement procedure involves. Um, urgent application, urgent interim applications before the English courts, which I think is, is a helpful feature of the system because obviously the English courts are incredibly responsive. Um, not to say that other courts aren't, but um, you, can, you can of course obtain an interim injunction over the weekend, as, as Vitaly was explaining. And um, yeah, I think, that, I think that could indeed. I think enforcement is key to attracting um, investor participation in a region and I think a tighter legal framework that assists participants in trading and in shipping yeah. and in other um, regional market activities could indeed assist to develop yeah. the economic growth within the Caspian region. Okay. You know that I mean we are in January 2019 then it's time for prediction. Then I'd like just uh, to check if uh, your point uh, could be in reality next year, I mean, doing a similar, similar uh, round table. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Luca? About? I mean, could, could, that last, uh, could uh, such a solution work? I mean, the, this kind of Caspian Arbitration Society, 
or could be a solution talking about uh, the countries involved? Uh, yes, or do you, do you agree with I this, mean, Sala? The, the, the future will tell us uh, if, I mean, users have to, to, to choose, of course, the, the rules of the Caspian Arbitration Society. Okay, I mean, uh, we could uh, take a look about the future if uh, our panelists are right or are wrong. <laughs> Um, I mean, going to fast, uh, uh, going ahead to, to the conclusion, uh, I would like to ask a, a sort of prediction about sanctions. Mm -hmm. If, uh, according to our panelists, uh, and also taking a look, uh, I mean, the general um, worldwide uh, situation, in particular, so I'm thinking about you, I'm thinking about uh, America. Yeah. What could happen in the next future, talk about sanctions uh, against uh, uh, Iran? Uh, in sanction against uh, Russia, because uh, they are, uh, according to, to my feeling, uh, uh, they are very different. Please. Well, we have seen, of course, um, continuing sanctions against Russia for events in the Ukraine. And although we've discussed at length today the rollback of sanctions against Russell, subsequent to Oleg Deripaska withdrawing his um, his ownership reducing it doubtless to below 50%, as of course Gennady Timchenko did um, in order to release Gunvor from, from sanctions several years earlier. Um, I don't think that the about turn on Roussel is necessarily going to lead to an about turn on other issues. I think we're going to see a continuing use of sanctions by the US against Russia in the way that it has. Um, perhaps it will be targeted in a way um, that is a little more um, discreet. Perhaps they won't target the, world, the world's largest aluminium producer in the future as, as they've, they've literally had to do an about face on, on that particular um, listing, the April 6 listing. Um, now on, on Iran, it will be very interesting to see how things develop um, and I think the US response to the special purpose vehicle will be something to watch out for. It's of course, it's been described as imminent apparently, but it's been imminent for a while, I think. Um, so, and, and the purpose of um, the EU's use of the special purpose vehicle, of course, is to keep Iran in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And the US itself is determined that um, its sanctions will be respected. So one thing one could imagine, depending how um, how the future plays out is that the special purpose vehicle might be created. We've heard perhaps France will host and perhaps it, there will be a German operator. And then perhaps the US will, will allow that transaction to go on. Perhaps food and medicines will be permitted. Or one alternative scenario one could foresee is that the special purpose vehicle itself might be listed as, a, as an SDN. And that of course would mean that transacting through that vehicle would become even more unpalatable for banks. And how could the Brexit uh, affect such, such a scenario? Um, the banks would, I think, in all probability, respect the listing and would refuse to process transactions, monies received from, through, to um, any listed entity. That would be my prediction. Thank you, Sarah. Is this perspective? What do you think? G give us your prediction about the future. My prediction yeah. is there will be no news with sanctions, or very few. If you sanction, talking about Switzerland. Very few. They, they, they won't follow the, the US approach, uh, and in very limited cases, the EU approach. I'd like also to ask to, I mean, to our guest if someone agree with our, our panelists, or, uh, I mean, if we have no questions, uh, no, no, no suggestions, we could uh, I mean, stop here the discussion. We could take a vote on whether the audience thinks the special purpose vehicle yeah. is likely to succeed or not. But actually, before the yeah. vote, so those I who think, those who thinks, think it's going to succeed, raise your right hand. Uh, I'm not raising my right hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe, maybe. No, I just want to comment on the uh, special uh, purpose vehicle because yeah. In investment arbitration, they have been used for a long time, but in recent years, without much success, because states are taking a more of a substance over form approach. Because yeah. my, I'm not an expert on sanction, but from what I understand from your presentation, the use of a, spe a special purpose vehicle, you, in essence, you'd be complying with 
the letter of the law, but in form only, but in substance, you're trying to get round the sanction. And I think states are very good at reacting to that. When they see that you're, there's a loophole where you're trying to um, take advantage of, so to speak, that they, they will try whatever they can to pluck that loophole. Because this is a trend that we can see in international uh, investment arbitration, where states has really tightened the grip on the use of special purpose vehicle. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It is, it is um, potentially a, a loophole. Indeed, that is the purpose. The purpose is to step outside of the US sanctions. And that is what the EU um, special representative has made clear. Let's just complete that vote and see if anyone votes against. Yeah. against. So we first, we had one or two saying that they thought the SPV was going to succeed. Does anyone think it's unlikely to succeed? And let's define success as trading large volumes of Iranian crude through the special purpose vehicle. Yeah, I, I think we've got a few people who can see some problems with, with that, as I've discussed. Um, so we'll have to, have to watch, watch this space, really. And the uh, last word to everybody. Uh, I've got to understand, uh, my, I mean, uh, how, um, how far should go due diligence? Talking about uh, money commodity trading companies and banks in, um, in the framework of sanctions. And also, generally speaking, because sometimes, I mean, due diligence seems to be a, just a boring topic, something just to, to, to go ahead on the paper. And it's tough to understand if you could just stop your, stop your, your check, your due diligence to your contractual parties, or if you should go much more ahead in, uh, in your e examination, please. Hmm. Uh, maybe uh, I would like to say something on, on um, AI and ma machine learning in terms of compliance. Um, Could be a solution, but uh, I mean, I, I mean in, in, uh, I wanted to, to have a general framework eh? mm -hmm. to, to understand that if I give you an example, it's easier. Then uh, you could add... Um, you, you go as far as you can. Know yeah. your customer, know your customer's customer. Know if, ideally, know the ultimate beneficial owner. Yeah. You can obtain detailed structural charts um, from Orbis, for example. And, of course, if you're not happy about your Iranian um, supplier or receiver, you can ask an Iranian lawyer to do a due diligence check on a local um, corporate... Um, company register so that you can really go right back. But the other thing to remember is it's not just the banking channel and the client and the client's client, it's also the, the um, service providers in the chain. So you have to watch out for, for example, a, a rail authority that may be listed that's going to be transporting um, uh, rail tank cars of product because that can throw the whole deal off. Um, and any other minor supplier, a listed um, Cuban shipping provider or Venezuela shipping operations provider can, um, a payment that doesn't comply, that's in, made in the wrong currency, that attracts sanctions at the wrong moment, it's really the full chain that you need to do your due diligence on, including, of course, your customer's bank and all the banks through the chain. And you need to go further than that. You need to think about insurance. So insurance is essentially prohibited in Iran now for, for trading. Um, you mentioned, Luca, about oh. the uh, artificial intelligence. Yes. How could uh, digitization and uh, artificial intelligence uh, support uh, uh, such a best practice in compliance? So I, I think it would be a very helpful tool, uh, especially in order to, to avoid false positives, as, as we call them. So for example, um, one SDN would be probably located uh, in Germany, but he lives in, in a street whose name is Baghdad Strasse. And because there is the Baghdad name in his address, it, there will be a red flag. So through ma machine learning and AI, I think the goal would be to avoid this kind of false positive and streamline the process of compliance. Thank you. Please, uh, just last word to everybody. L last say, last yeah. word, if I may, on Brexit, because sometimes people want to know what effect Brexit might have on sanctions. Um, almost all UN and EU sanctions are currently adopted in the UK through the directly applicable EU regulations. So Brexit will have a significant impact on sanctions in the UK in that the UK will naturally need a new legal framework 
um, to continue to enforce sanctions which they'll need to adopt, whether they originate from the UK or from the UN reflected into UK national legislation. But the key sanctions risks for businesses post-Brexit are that the UK regime may potentially add another layer of complexity because they may diverge, of course, they may take their own path and not follow EU um, sanctions. And where the UK itself independently decides to impose sanctions, it may do so quickly and suddenly uh, and therefore create an extra layer of bureaucracy that banks and traders um, and service providers need to be uh, acutely aware of. Luca, final word on the two, really in, in two words, uh, I mean, uh, outline uh, which one is uh, the best word in order to mitigate sanction. Which one is the, 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 the best point? It's uh, prevention. 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 Prevention, absolutely. So um, a great compliance team um, must be put in place by companies. And then, uh, of course, this compliance team would be in charge of instilling good practices uh, within the company. Brian, I don't know if you would like just to, 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 to close our panel. Well, uh, from the investor protection perspective, I think uh, that I, I also use two words. So first, you look at the treaties available, try to, to get covered by investment treaty. And if that's not possible, then you, you, you have to resort to your contract and you negotiate uh, very uh, robust and strong terms that are favorable to you. Thank you. You could stop our, yeah, our discussion and update uh, same panel to the next year you know, to, to understand if our prediction, our suggestion, they really went in place. Thank you. Thank you.